We're doing a little gallery now. Our demonstration is Bob Grinstead tonight. See, Bob's in the in the, uh, the in the office, right? So, Bob, if you're set up, we'd probably pop right over to you, sir, and then we'll come back to our uh, to our, our gallery in just a little bit. Um, How about now? Can you hear me, guys? Now we, we got you, Bob. Yes, sir. Yeah, we uh, got you. I, I don't know if you can see me yet. Um, yeah. What do you see? Here. All right. We'll, we'll can try you see again. anything? Nope, don't see it. I got you spotlighted now. <laughs> you're always changing your name on how you're going to put yourself in there, Bob Grinstrad. Uh, oh, I know. Grinstrad, well, I, Bob. I, had to, I had to flip over to uh, just the phone, so uh, I don't know what it's going to show. All Can good. you find me yet? Oh, I oh, got you're you. Down. You're up there. Uh, you're here. Well, I don't see you. I don't see myself. All I see is a couple of frozen pictures here, so I don't know how to get out of this thing. We see you're doing good. You're doing good. Okay, all right. Yes, we are you. Uh, yeah, I kind of had a blind here, but uh, anyhow, I don't. I don't do a lot of demos. It's the second one I've ever done, so uh, just kind of bear with me here. Uh, what this is is a. Uh, I, I watched a demo at my local club on. Uh, epoxy coating and it looked real interesting and I decided I wanted to try it and uh, it was an inexpensive way to uh, to get into it uh, the guy that I saw uh, used the same motor that I have that I bought but he was actually driving three shafts with it he, uh, he had three different stations set up and they were driven by rubber bands between the shafts and, and that worked out okay but i don't know that i really want the uh the three shafts so i just made one and uh it worked fine for what i wanted to do i guess you know if you if you had more shaft you wouldn't waste so much of the uh epoxy because you'd have because you're always going to have some left over you'd have some place you could put it or or to do something with it. uh the idea of the shaft, you want a slow turning uh, shaft. So you want to put it on something that'll actually turn the base or turn the, whatever you're trying to put the epoxy in. Because it, it uh, doesn't allow it to drift. It's not, it lets it flow around the, the base or around the top. And uh, it, won't, it won't actually drip off of it. Uh, here's one piece I made. This was, uh, I think I showed this a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and again, I don't know what you're seeing. Can you see this or not? Oh, yeah. Yes, sir. Okay, this uh, this was a uh, Beads of Courage box. And uh, I decided I wanted to, uh, they, you know, what they did, they talked about all the Beads of Courage boxes that were bought last year, and they couldn't use them. They had to throw them away because they had cloth on the outside of them. You know, they'd use PVC and put cloth on them, and it made them real cute for kids. But they didn't, they don't, you know, they're hard to clean. So they really can't clean them in a hot. So they want a hard surface so they can uh, wipe it off and clean it. So I decided to make mine in the uh, hot. Uh, and it turned out real good. I, I was uh, glad, I mean, you know, happy about how it turned out. This is a separate piece um, that I glued in here. And I wanted them to be epoxy together. I wanted that seam to be, you know, have epoxy over it and not to really be a, a seam or anything to get in. So the epoxy worked out good. Uh, how I held it was right here in the center. I, uh, I knew I was going to put this bead in here. So I could put a, drill the hole and put the saran wrap around a dowel and shove it in the hole. And that's how I actually held it on the uh, jig. Let me get the jig here. This, this is just a uh, strap block, you know, just a, what do you call it, uh, glue block. And uh, anyway, I glued that in here and was able to turn this thing. Because there's no pressure on it. There's no, uh, there's nothing here except this thing turning around and around. And you put a brush on it with the epoxy. So it worked out real well. And then, then I could come back and drill a bigger hole just for the uh, B courage. But, and then I did come back and epoxy that in. Uh, the, the problem to me with the epoxy, and it's probably not a problem, it's just, you know, I, I'm one of these guys that, like Eddie was talking about a while ago, I don't like to do a, a whole lot of work. I want to do it the easiest way I can. 
and uh, you have a dry line, or I'm going to call it a dry line. It's, it's when you put the epoxy on and you're trying to hold it. This one I held with a tenon on. And uh, so I had the tenon on and I put the epoxy on here first. I was able to epoxy the inside and the outside. And uh, then when you, you know, you said, okay, well, that all worked out great. So I got two, two coats of this, by the way, two coats of epoxy. The first coat is uh, all the little air bubbles and everything comes out. All the imperfections kind of get filled. And you come back and you sand it down. It's like a 150 grit sandpaper. You sand it down and put the second coat on it after it's dried. And, it's second coat. and it will fill up all those imperfections. But when you try to finish this bottom, you know, I'm thinking, well, you know, what am I going to do there? So, uh, because you have this, again, this dry line, it's the line between the first coating or whatever you got. Let's say it's the first coating. In this case, it was the second coating because that's why I stopped. Uh, and then I took it off and took, took the, uh, tenon off and sanded it, ground it down, sanded it down and put epoxy on it. The epoxy there turned out fine. It's, it's where this line between this epoxy and the previous one went together. There you end up with some type of a little little dry line or some line that you can actually see. And uh, you, know, you need some way to either get rid of it. You, you know, you can either buff it out, sand it out and buff it out and, and you can actually polish it. You know, that's what I guess most people do. But uh, the people that I saw the video. I mean, I watched lots of videos. I watched this guy's demo, and he really didn't discuss how you how you handle this dry line. I'm talking about. So, what I did, I I tried to just epoxy it up to here. Of course, you know it ran over the side, so now I got a problem. So then I had to sand it down and buff it back out, and I'm actually buffed it with uh, Vonex. And Vonex will buff it down to like 1500. And that worked out okay. I mean, it's not as shiny as this over here where I didn't buff it, but it's enough to where I'm not going to mess with it. I, I, I could have sat here and went and got the stuff or polished it out, but I didn't do it. So I'm just going to leave it. But I, I think it still turned out fine. Uh, this, there was enough here. Let me, the guy that, uh, that did this, the demo that I saw, he uh, he bought this epoxy. This was at uh, Hobby Lobby, and it's like 19.95 for two eight-ounce bottles. So for 16 ounces, this is a, to me it was a cheap way to get into an epoxy. There might be cheaper epoxies out here, and I'm sure if you bought them by the gallon, it'd probably be cheaper too. Yeah. But this was this was an easy way to get in for twenty dollars. And the twenty dollars I had to do to do four items. I had enough to do the top and bottom of uh, of this, so you know that was quite a bit. So that was two ounces for the bottom, and I used an ounce up here of the glue, a total. And uh, so this thing, if I had extra glue in. There was another one. I, I think that was about an ounce, and it you know coated both sides. And, I, and each coat was an ounce, so uh, you know it does take a little bit of it. But uh, but the second coat, you know, when I sanded it out, I put the second coat on. It comes out smooth enough for me. Uh, John Williams is a guy that I that I really like his video. He had a YouTube video. I think he's out of Florida, but in his video. He actually uh, puts on three coats before he really sands it back down. You know, he, he puts on a coat and he lets it get tacky and he puts on another coat and lets it get tacky. And uh, he puts on like three coats, two or three coats like that. And uh, then he comes back and sands it down and gets all the little divots and, and all the little mismatches out of it. And he ends up putting four or five coats on. His look really pretty. I mean, he, he's selling these big items for, you know, big dollars. So he's doing a real good job at it. Uh, in his video, he really didn't discuss this dry line either. You know, he, he talked about turning off the bottom and 
epoxy in the bottom, and that's about all he really says. But if you go in and you look at the, uh, the chat section down below, the comment section, he does get further into it in the comments and uh, saying that he does sand it and he, he doesn't really address the dry line, but it's the same thing. He's going to come back and sand the whole bowl again and buff the whole thing out. And, uh, you know, he takes it down to 5,000 and then he comes back with uh, the polishing compounds and, and uh, polishes and buffers and buffs them out. And they look real pretty. But his jigs, I mean, go look at his video. I'll put it in the chat after a while, but uh, go look at his video. It's, uh, it really is, that really does have some pretty stuff. But anyway, I was able to make this bowl, uh, the Deeds of Courage box, a, uh, an 11 inch by 3 inch bowl. And the last one I'm going to do is a, in a little small 6 or 7 inch bowl. I'm going to have enough to do that. I'm going to mix up one ounce to do this one. The, uh, the way I'm going to try, it, you know, again, this is trial and error for me, because I'm again, no expert here. But for me, I'm go I went ahead and you know took the mortise and finished it out, signed it, and put epoxy in. And I'm hoping that's the last coat I'm going to do. So that's the intent here. And it did come up a little around the edge, and that's what I wanted. I wanted to be sure to coat that edge. And then I sanded the edge down, and then I hot glued this this piece on. And this piece is actually going to hold it in my chuck while it turns. And then after we get through, I just pop this off and the hot glue will come off of here, uh, you know, with a, a alcohol or some vinegar, I think vinegar is what takes it off. Anyway, it will come off here, you know, because I tried that before. But it, it might leave a little divot where the, where the hot glue was on here. But me, in my experience with the epoxy, even an epoxy table I did four or five years ago, if you have it stuck and sitting on here, it's going to leave a little divot. And you move it, and that divot flattens back out. And I and that's what it's going to do here. It's going to flatten back out if it, if it leaves anything at all. But, uh, but let me show you my my jig here. Uh, this I thought was a real good jig. The, uh, the jig I made is not, I don't know if you can see it. Can you see this? Uh, this whoa. It's it. Oops. Yeah. Whoa, that one's right on the ground, isn't it? I fall down. Yeah, yeah. Let me see here. I'm okay. I'm okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's okay. Okay, let's see what oops, what can I do here? Yeah, maybe a little more. How about that? All right, can you see this jig or not? Yes. That's good, Bob. Uh tell me yeah. where the camera needs. Does that look okay? The jig's right in the center You're of the right face. in the center. Okay. All right. What I did, and you know, he did basically the same thing. He had the same motor. You get this motor can off. You of see, can Amazon you zoom in closer? Uh, hell, I can't hear you. Can you zoom in closer? Closer. Let me uh, see There's here. There's not what? a zoom oh, function on Zoom. Well, well I don't, don't worry about it. There's not. There's not a zoom function for zoom. The forward. Um, your camera yeah, the positioning is good. Camera. No. Okay. What you would have to do is pinch your screen, just like as if you're zooming in on a photo or zooming in on a video that you're doing. Uh, I'm trying, but I'm. Uh, problem is, I'm looking at y'all. I'm not looking at the. <laughs> I don't see myself. Right? Can we go? I see all the people. Yeah. Can we go back to what we were looking at? That and, and yeah, yeah, yeah. Here, let's just go back here. It's a good All thing. Right. Can, you, can you see it? Okay. And what I did, good. I he he had actually made a box. He had a rectangle box here, and he had a, a shaft going through it, and he had you know high dollar collars, high dollar uh, uh, bearings, and all these other different adapters on it. And I thought, well, there's a cheaper way to do it. So for $30 here, I've got a $15 motor off of Amazon. I have a, I bought a all threaded rod, you know, one inch, eight thread per inch. And uh, nuts, these nuts are cheap, right? you know, so that's what I use. So I drilled the nuts out for my bearing. 
So there's really no heat, there's no speed, there's no tension on it. All it's doing is turning. You know, if you if you instead of instead of this all grid, you could go to car, uh, tractor supply and buy a bolt. They have one inch bolts there, and then you wouldn't have to worry about the threads. You could put this in plywood and just use the plywood for a bearing. Or you could even, you know, or do like I did. I drilled out the threads out of these two nuts right here to use as a bearing. I mean, there's there's lots of different ways to do this, but the main thing is to be able to mount it. So I mounted it, and again, his had three different uh, uh, shafts out here that were driven by the uh, band uh, rubber band. But uh, this one, well, this motor will actually go both directions. So I bought a uh, pack of you know switches. I think it was ten of them for ten dollars on it, on Amazon. But it's a single pole, the uh, double position switch. You know, it's an on, off, and an on switch, but it's a single pole switch. So I can go either direction with it. And uh, again, it's turning 10 to 12 revolutions per minute. So he's a, you know, a good slow turn. And all I have is just clamp to the table. But, you know, there's lots of other ways to do this and lots of different setups. But to me, this was the cheapest. And just to get me into it to see if I really wanted to do this, it worked out great. Yeah. So I've got thirty dollars in this, and uh, it's uh, it's fun. So let me uh, let me go on to a proxy in one of these on here. You know, this thing will come off here. Let me uh, bring it back around. I can pull the pin out, and now I can turn this thing freely, so I can actually screw it onto my chuck easier. Yeah. And then I can come back and pin it back in. Somewhere here he goes back in. Bob, it looks like you've got set screws in two of those bolts. Is that right? I mean nuts. Uh, I, I do. I, you know, instead of buying, you know, you can come in and buy uh, shaft collars. And, and I said, well, I mean, the, the, the nuts are a whole lot cheaper than a shaft collar. They're only like 50 cents a piece. So I just made, I bought, you know, the two nuts, drilled them, you know, tapped them out and put set screws in here just so I could get them uh, a collar on each side tight so this thing's not trying to go everywhere, you know. Cool. That's what that was for. Uh, let me put the bowl in here. So for $50, you know, I've got a... Uh, a turning deal and was able to get uh, epoxy enough for you know, several of these bolts. Can you actually see the bowl or not? Move it a little to your right. Is that better? Perfect. Yeah. Uh, you kind of wobble here. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, so what I'm going to do is to mix up some of this epoxy and uh, and do it. The uh, the guy that in this local video in this local club, he used uh, these brushes. They were off of Amazon. They're a pro grade uh, brush, and I'll put that stuff in the chat too. But his his whole idea is he wanted because even though there's not a whole lot, there is some stickiness to the epoxy, and it will tend to try to draw your bristle. So he wanted stuff so where the bristles wouldn't come out. And uh, you could have, I think you, I could have got by with some of the Harbor Freight little brushes that are cheap and 50 cents a piece or something, but uh, but I didn't. I bought a box of these to try. But anyway, so let me uh, let me mix this stuff up real quick and just show you how it goes on. It goes on real well. Uh, For those just joining us this evening, Bob Grinstead is showing us how to apply uh, an epoxy coating on a finished piece. He has shown a couple of pieces he's done earlier. Uh, right now, he's explaining a rig that he's using that was shop built by him and uh, how he's holding the piece. And now he's going to mix up the resin and go ahead and do a demonstration on how to apply the coating 
and this could be a really it could be a fun indoor project for you people that are baking out in the heat you might be able to do this on a kitchen table when she's not home uh, yeah. yeah i just didn't want to do it in the house guys that's for sure nothing like getting it on the carpet or uh, the floor but anyway right now i have i have two uh two deals the same amount in these little cups these little cups i i got free i went to uh uh not burger king anyway i went to one of those places and got the little condiment cups because they're cheap well, i'm gonna pour it into another cup this is another plastic cup and i have a uh popsicle stick that uh, i'm going to use to mix this stuff up with and get it out of these cups they they recommend that you don't uh, don't mix less than one ounce, and that's about what this is. It's going to end up being. Actually, going to end up being about closer to two ounces. But it's just an ounce a piece. So it won't take long to mix this up. You do have to uh, stir it good, mix it good. Like any other epoxy, you want it mixed up good. And it'll kind of, you know, turn white. I don't know if you can see that or not, but it's almost like it's got bubbles in it until it, until it mixed well. Members, if you have questions or comments on this procedure, uh, will you kind of let that Bob finish his demonstration and then we'll open it up for questions and comments, etc. And remember, we have that no but guarantee. Uh, I like this. No buts about it. I like this. No buts. All right. I, I do too. No buts. I'm sure there are lots of people out there that have done this already. I'm just, you know, I'm just trying to show you an easy way, cheap way to try it. And it is a good fit. Okay, once you get it mixed up, then you put it in the microwave or somehow heat it up. Uh, I'm putting it in a microwave for eight seconds at half power. So bear with me, I'm gonna do that real quick. Microwave it? Yeah. yeah. You could it's also like use- In the kitchen, it makes food warm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you're just gonna heat it up a little bit and it uh, makes it soft. Okay, so that was eight seconds at uh, 50 power, and you can see it's quite runny now. And that's what you want, you want it runny. So it'll go in and fill in and get in there, get on everything. And all I'm gonna do is just drizzle it on here and just let it run. Again, there might be better ways to do this, but. Uh, It seems to be working for me. Now on this inside, I really don't want to get down onto that other piece if I can. And I'm kind of stay trying to stay away from it just so I get, because uh, I'm going to come back with another coat, remember? And I don't want it real thick right there, and I don't want a bunch I have to try to take care of. That epoxy kind of warm. Bob, so this is a single application used for this particular brush, right? Yes. Uh, well, it is, but you can take this brush, and that's what I'm going to do in a minute. And uh, actually, well, that didn't make it. That melted my plastic cup here. That, uh, but you can take this one single application on the brush and put it in, a, in uh, 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 start with A. What is it, guys? Acetone. <laughs> Acetone, there you go. Put it in acetone and it will, uh, it'll be fine. So. Oh, okay. So this, this stuff is already, uh, got too hot and he's trying to set up here. So I'm making a mess, man. But anyhow, that's, uh, that's the way you're supposed to do it. And, uh, supposed to be able, don't get it too hot. I must have left that thing in there too long. So I can at least do the outside. I'm not going to be able to do the inside of it. 
<clears throat> and then put this brush into some acetone and uh, you can use it again next time, you know, for come back in four hours or even tomorrow. That's what I'm going to do. And because I'm going to have to come back and stand that inside out. It's not that that didn't work at all. It, it got way too hot and set up on me. I love um, microwave them. Uh, those, those cheap HEB cups don't don't take the, the uh, epoxy too well, in my opinion. The uh, oh yeah, you're probably right. You're probably right. But I, actually, what I did here, I screwed up on the microwave and I put in eight, and uh, he didn't uh, he didn't take the eight seconds. He did something like eight minutes, and anyway, he cooked it too long. But uh, anyhow. It'll still work for what I'm doing tonight and what I'm waiting to show you. But that's that really all you do is you let it sit here. Um, if it, it has a 10 minute uh, timing, I guess, uh, to set up. So after a few minutes, like right about now, you should come back with some type of a heat gun or something just to get the air bubbles off of it. And you don't want a whole lot of heat either. You just want a little bit of heat and uh, it'll take most of the air bubbles out. And uh, then once it dries, you can come back and sand it and you put another coat on it and uh, then it'll be done. Except I hope, yeah, even this bottom, the bottom should be done then too. But, uh, hey, hey, Bob, when, the, you get, uh, when you get a chance, could you uh, zoom in on your motor and how that's how that's tied into that rod? That's uh, that's yeah. not going to work for us, Tim. We tried yeah. doing the yeah. same thing, so. No, but I can get it closer. I can get the camera closer. Uh, but let me let me tell you one other thing. The uh, the epoxy, I think one ounce will cover about 160 square inches. That, that's what I figured out on this uh, on the barrel I had over here. These are the actual switches that I bought from Amazon. It was ten of them for ten dollars. I mean they're they're cheap enough. And, uh, well, I got a bunch left over, but that's okay. But they are a uh, three position switch, single pole. There's only you know, one set of poles going across here. And now uh, you can make it show both directions. Let me, uh, let me do zoom in here. Let me get this mess out of my way. And, uh, see if I, I can zoom in a little more here. Can you see the motor yet? Yeah, yep. we can see it. Yep. Okay, so what I've done here is, uh, well, let me take this off here. Maybe this is better. What I've done is uh, drilled a hole in the center of my shaft just to fit the shaft of the motor. And uh, then I pinned it, you know, I have a pin in here. And you have to have some slop in there because, you know, everything is not going to line up perfectly. I mean, you know, my hole is probably not in the center, uh, whatever. So uh, so you have to have some, some deep room here for this motor to move a little slop. But that's not hard to do. Uh, the, uh, the actual switch itself, can you see the switch down here? Yeah. Can you all, can you all see the back of the switch? Yep. Yes, sir. Okay. All right. Well, it has a capacitor between the, between the two leads, and that's what the, the, like a starter capacitor, letting it go one direction or the other. So it's real simple, real easy to wire up. Uh, nothing, nothing special here. You don't like I said, you don't have to make this thing out of metal. I just that's just what I have, and it's easier for me to do. You know, I could have just as easily had been a a uh, plywood box. With, with bushings of some kind, maybe not, you know, like I said, just uh, just the plywood would be enough bushing if you didn't have these threads. If it was just a bolt sliding around in a hole in a plywood, because it, it had no pressure, there's no speed to get hot, so it would last forever like that. Or you could epoxy these bolts, these uh, nuts in, you know, that I drilled out, drilled the threads out. Of. You could epoxy those in. But, uh, but that's it, guys. That's about all I have. I don't know what else to show you. Uh, I love that. I will finish. go back. Do what now? I said I love that finish. 
Oh yeah, the finish turned out real good. You know, That's the, the, the first shine coat, I'm looking for. Yeah, it's real shiny, and and when you get, you know, when you build up the coats on here, it really looks deep. You know, all of it really looks deep in here, and it's real pretty. Uh, the first and coat has smell. a lot of bubbles, different things, but. You know, when you finally get the third, the next coat will level it out more. The next one on top of that, if you keep going, they just keep leveling it out. Uh, John Williams doesn't even sand the first two or three coats. After three coats, then he sands it. And uh, and probably, and then he puts on two more or three more final coats. Do you just let it run until it dries? Uh, yeah, you let this run. It doesn't have to run until it dries. You have to run... Uh, until uh, what does it say here? It, it's about a it's about ten minutes. I think it doesn't say it on there, yeah. but it's it's about ten or twelve minutes before it'll get hard and it won't try to slip off on you. And it won't point, run. You turn it off. And once it starts drying, it's not going to run down on you anymore. Then, right? Yeah. After about ten minutes, it won't run down anymore, and you can turn it off. But I'm going to keep it running for a little while. Uh, it, it gets it still be tacky in about four hours and you could and if you didn't want to sand between these coats i'm gonna to have to because there are air bubbles i can see um so anyway if you didn't want to sand or if you didn't have to sand between coats you could put another coat on in like four hours and have it still tacky and put the other coats on and then wait till tomorrow you know when it's completely dry and then come back and sand it and you could either either sand it then if it didn't look good, or you could put another uh, another coat on it. What I did on these other pieces, I did the first coat and waited till the next day to where it was dry so I could sand it, and then put the second coat on. And they come out slick enough for what I want. I my mind doesn't have to have ever little in, you know dip out of it. So, anyway. Anyway, guys, I thought that was a cheap and easy way to get into it and to see what epoxy turnings like or epoxy finishes is like. And uh, yeah, I'll try it. Maybe you'll have fun with it. You well, got to be careful with the, which epoxy you use, too. If you use a slow curing epoxy, it's not going to work. It'll be turning forever. Um, <laughs> yeah, if you have something that is not going to set up for four hours, yeah, it's going to have to turn for four hours. Yeah, but a slow turn, I, I think, the slow cure on epoxy will allow the bubbles and everything to migrate out of it and give you a better finish. Yeah, it will. Penetrate the wood finish deeper as well. Yeah. A non-thermal yeah, curing sure. epoxy is much better than a thermal curing epoxy because that's what gives you all the bubbles. It heats up as it cures. Are you talking about a UV epoxy or are you talking something else? No, oh, like there's uh, epoxies that heat up and transfer heat when they dry, so they create bubbles oh, yeah. in the process. So by using yeah. epoxy, it heats up the air within those bubbles to release those bubbles. But you can also use slow curing epoxies that are non-thermal curing. It's just a much longer curing time, and there's no heat being produced. So it doesn't produce bubbles and it self levels itself in the process. Right. Yeah. And, that, and that might be a good idea. The, yeah. the, the other thing to get rid of bubbles is you can use a uh, heat gun. Yeah, heat gun, hair dryer, anything. To just, and you don't want to leave it long because you don't want to burn that epoxy. You can burn it real quick. But what you did by heating the epoxy so much it accelerated the cure time. Yeah. yeah. And, and that's basically what I. Sorry, go ahead. That's was, okay. I, that's basically what I did in that little plastic cup. I heated it too long, so by the time I started to do the inside, it had already set up, and then it was ruined. You know, the epoxy is already set up inside that little cup. It already, it got too hot. But uh, but anyway, for nineteen dollars, uh, you know, a lot of that stuff is you know a hundred dollars for epoxy, and I didn't want to try that. So. Bob, what is the speed of your motor there? Uh, it's 10, I think it's 10 to 12 uh, revolutions per second. Okay. And there, there's lots of them out there on YouTube, I mean on uh, Amazon. 
Uh, you can probably buy them anywhere, but there's a lot of them on Amazon. This one was fourteen ninety five when I bought it, and I saw today it's up to seventeen ninety five. Yeah, so it's uh, that looks a lot strange. slower than that. Yeah, it's it's not per second; it's per minute. Uh, it's per minute. Okay, that might be it. Might be per minute, but uh, but it's ten or twelve, whatever it is. Probably is per minute, not second. Yeah. Okay. And if you can get a hold of an old microwave, you can take the uh, the motor that turns the plate. Yeah, yeah there you go. Goodwill, good they're ten dollars. Yep. But uh, but for fifty dollars, I was able to try it and make an, an epoxy four thing. So uh, I think it's I think it was a good a good experiment. Here. Oh, yeah. uh, once again, yeah, Bob, excellent good. demo, and, and thanks for working through all the uh, the setups and everything you had to do. At I know you. I know you've been working on this for a while and you back with me on being able to put this on. So it's, it's really great. I appreciate it. All right. All yes. right. Well, I appreciate Thank it. You, Thank you, Bob. Good stuff. Good job. Good job. Do you have any problem. questions? Thank you, Bob. That's good. Any questions? I'll you have come back in a minute and you can ask me questions if you still have them. Thanks for the demo, Bob. Okay. I, I have I have one question. What when you say you're going to sand it next? Are, are you putting it back on the lathe again and doing it at, at the lathe speed of I mean whatever you want, or how are you sanding it? Can you can you ask? Me? How's that? I don't know if he's still with us. He was. Uh, he said he'd be back in a few moments. So we'll we'll we'll. We'll get back to Bob if you yeah, he's going to clean up here. Yeah, I have I have I have sanded off I epoxy off the lathe. I've done it both with power sanding using my Fordham so I can control the speed of the sand, uh, the the mandrel, and by hand, just you know sandpaper in my hand going like that. So um, the blend lines, like I used to use epoxy on on the goblets. And there's no way to do the whole thing at once. So getting the blend, getting the, the where the where the you know the bottom and the top blend lines overlapped had to be sanded smooth before you put the next bit on. So that was always interesting. But I usually did that by hand. And some of the things I did, I did with a, a sanding mandrel using my Fordham, which is a rotary tool. So to answer that question. Yeah, I've done the same. Demo, right, man. Type of sanding. Uh, I, I made mine wet, um, and, and that's after you have the whole piece coated, and you want to go back and, and take out that blend line or that dry line. Um, a, a wet sandpaper helps. I did say after you let it, you get the whole piece coated, because if you put epoxy on one half and you wet sand and you put moisture in the other part, you created a whole new scheme of things. So. Um, yes. I suppose with the caveat that, that I, I usually put two coats of epoxy on the whole piece before I started doing any same. So, yep. Yeah. Yeah. And what, there you go. what a minute ago, what we were explaining with the coats with, uh, he said that uh, the guy that created this program would do several coats. Alan Trout is where I learned how to do CA finish probably 15 years ago. And he would do three, four, five coats. Um, before he would start knocking it back down again, knocking it back down, he would do a coat. About the time it took him to get the pad ready for the next coat, he'd do a coat. Same thing, do a coat. And then it hit a low accelerant and then sand it out. And just like we got a minute ago from Bob Grinstead is, that's a technique. Now Bob's technique is put it on, let it build up, cure out or set out, uh, and then sand it a little bit more and it's just like ca it's using this product there's probably a thousand different techniques um so if you saw bobs and you want to play with it play with it go with it um i he's going to put all those ingredients and on the on his um on our chat tonight save the chat before you go and i'm going to see if we can develop a sketch of a wooden one with components you could probably buy through Embassy Direct or McMaster Car or Granger or one of those places that you can do the exact same rig with and build it yourself for your shop. Um, and a little motor that he had that 
coupled off the end. Um, and he said the, the gentleman that created this was using a lot of the rubber bands to go through it. If you're more, if it's more convenient to place that motor below it, or use a rotisserie motor out of a barbecue pit. I saw somebody say that. But you know, sometimes those rotisserie motors cost $40, $50. And you got to pay a big box store to, have to get them for you. Um, so, you know, there's a trade out on that. Uh, I like the idea that Bob had with uh, buying it from Amazon. He got a motor from Amazon, switched from Amazon, and pretty much everything else came out of a hardware store. Now, it, in your mind's eye, get rid of that nice uh, stand that he has there and make the whole thing out of, get it, MDF. Um, means the base, the verticals, everything else. And because you're only turning at maybe 10 RPMs or 12 RPMs, MDF will hold up. That's your best friend at that time would be Johnson's Face Wax. Wax up the inside, put the pieces together, and that's your bushing right there, the Johnson Face Wax. So this is a very easy demonstration that Bob just gave you. Uh, Bob did quite well on it, I gotta say that. Uh, but he gave you some variants in the ability to kind of modify or morph out this this kit and how to do it. Um, someone said your lathe goes slow enough to do in your lathe. You know, that might be true. You could do in your lathe very slow. All right, number one, that's hard on your lathe. You think slow would not be. Slow is sometimes hard on your lathe. It's a cooling problem. Uh, number two, I'm not putting that stuff over my lathe bed. I got my lathe diaper, but, you know, a little bit of that hitting the bed and going underneath. I'd be like Don, uh, or Brenda, beating it, go back and forth because it's sticking. Um, so consider the alternatives when you <laughs> put the diaper on before you put the resin on them. <laughs> oh, yeah. My diaper is always there. It, 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 somebody, why, why do you have that? Take something, that, the tool, your, your, your wrench, your pliers, your screwdriver, your pencil, whatever, and set it on the bed of your lathe and then use your lathe, the harmonics is going to go to the floor. And we all know turning tools, God says they have to go point down when they land. Um, the, the, the lathe diaper, they don't vibrate off. My wife made me the, the one I have. I'm at the show to y'all again in, in a little bit. Uh, she made me that one. I use it all the time. It's constantly waiting. Let me see. There it is. Right back there. That's the lathe diaper, right on the top of my lathe. And I've got four magnets on it to hold it in place. Uh, magnets are an option. Um, she quilted it, because she's the queen of quilting, um, and made it look nice. I have a couple of it. She made me some in some other colors that I don't think I want to use. Um, I mean, Captain? Go ahead, please. Hey, Scott! Hey, I'm the one, one of the guys that put in the rotisserie motor. I find mine at garage sales, flea markets. I've never bought a new one. Um, and I just put a pulley on the outboard side of my lathe with a belt. And then I use a silicon mat with stick-on magnets to stick the silicon mat to my lathe bed because the epoxy doesn't stick to the silicon so you can keep pulling it off. I would just wonder about the effect on a lathe running a, a, a motor and slow turning. Uh, I've got a Jet 1642 that doesn't go below 100, but I would just wonder what harm it would do to my lathe. I, that's why I use the rotisserie motor. It, it, I don't turn my motor on on my lathe. The rotisserie motor is the motor. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, the, the, the spindle should free spin without any problem. It won't do any damage to the lathe. If the lathe is Fine. meant to go that slow and goes that slow, it won't damage right. the lathe at all. Right. All one-way lathes go really slow. Yeah, I, it's, it's a lot the of, same with the powermatics. <laughs> a lot of heat built up when you take a three-phase motor or a multi-phase motor and you, you step down in the power, there's a lot of energy generated. Um, if you if you know, I get by it with mine with a very expensive six dollar clip-on fan, 
I open my control box, put the fan down, and blow some extra air on it. It works. I can go slow, real slow, and do a, a lot of correction sanding and stuff. But um, I think what we just now heard from Scott was uh, that motor, that rotisserie motor, has got a pretty good bit of torque. It, it stepped down within itself. And I mean, it's turning a, a, a turkey or a ham over a barbecue pit, and that always balanced out. So that might be one one way to, to, to look at it, um, and uh, that's what you do with that old barbecue stuff that you can't use anymore. Man, I love barbecue, but look, this shirt's 14 years old. Look how loose it fits. I'm loving this stuff. I'd die for barbecue right now. I really would. If you want somebody killed, just bring me a pack of ribs. You know, all all done up, and I'll knock them off. It's uh, you know, you gotta do what you gotta do. Okay, um, the only Bob is back with us again. Uh, Bob, uh, let me pop on you for one second. Sure. Someone asked about uh, when you're sanding it. Uh, can a member that asked that question ask it to Bob? Go ahead. Yeah, it was regarding the sanding. Do you put it back? Do you mount the bowl back on the lathe? and turn it on the lathe to sand it, or do you just sand it on your slow turning? I, I've i done it both ways, you know, on those two, four items that I made there. I, I did it both ways, but it sands real, it's real soft. You know, the next morning it really hadn't hardened. It takes, you know, three or four to five days to really harden. So at that point, it's still soft enough. You can do it by hand. You know, you, you're 150 cent grit sandpaper and, uh, it, it sands real easy. And it doesn't have to be anything more than 150 because you're going to put another coat on top of it and it'll all level back out again. You know, if you want, if you want to wait until it actually dries and, you know, you want to stand up to, you know, 800 or 5,000 or whatever you can. And then that's what these guys do on the joints you know, where they join together because they don't want to see where it overlaps. Some of these guys actually, you know, a couple of them that I, I talked to, they don't even, they sand it, but, you know, it's like to, you know, two or 300, maybe 400. And then they come back with shoot lacquer over the top of it. Still makes it shiny. You know, it's just that you have the overspray, so you got to watch the overspray. But uh, one guy even just put CA glue on it. You know, he said, well, just take, put it on a rag and wipe CA over it, and it'll make a coating over the top of it. Uh, even this John Williams that I was referring to here, and you put the video in the link, but uh, he, he says that he feels some of the divots or some of the uh, bad spots. Instead of trying to sand them out, he fills them with CA glue, or if they're bigger than that, then he comes back and he puts the epoxy in them and sands them back down again. So there's several different ways to do this. It's not, I don't know if there's anything cut in stone. You know, you just do it however you can get it to work for you. Okay, how's that work for you, Gary? Well, okay. I wasn't the one who asked the question, but I just remembered what he oh. asked. But that's a good, uh, yeah, yeah, kind of an an experimentation and figure out what works for you. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Cause everybody's going to be a little different. You know, I didn't, I didn't want to buff it all the way out. I, you know, I'd have to go buy the buffing pads and buy the polish. I, I actually bought the polish, but it was the wrong type of polish. So that was $15. I'm not, I'm not going to do that again. So <laughs> stop it at the, at the, at the Bonex and wax. and <laughs> That'll be good enough. You know, John Skelfo of New Jersey says you can get Virotex epoxy at Michael's with a coupon for about $12. It's a slow cure. The finish is perfect when it's cured. So there we've got another member yeah. throwing a nickel on the table. Yeah. So, so it's an easy way. I mean, with these, with Michael's and Home Depot, it's an easy way to get into the epoxy finishes. You know, you're not trying to cure it. You're not trying to have a pressure pot, you know, or your, your, putting big chunks and big items, you know, but uh, these little $12 and $20 boxes is a way to get into epoxy finishes 
and play with it. And uh, and I think it's worth playing with. Uh, I don't know that I'm really crazy about it, but uh, but it is worth playing with. And it does look real pretty, real shiny, real glossy, and uh, it comes out them. like glass. They have their place, for sure. Yeah. They do, and for what Bob, uh, for what Bob is using for it, he's putting on a beads of courage container, and that is a project that SWAT is really big in supporting. Uh, he's putting beads of courage. This is going to go to a hospital for children who are not well to handle. So what he's done with this epoxy is he's created a great finish that can be cleaned, uh, sterilized, wiped down, and all. And it's not going to come off on their hands. It's not going to degrade. It's not going to trap bacteria and stuff like that. So the finish Bob just put on was probably the most ideal finish you could do for this kind of piece. And honestly, you're giving it to a child for them to collect the beads when they get their treatments. If it doesn't shine like a diamond, it's okay. If it's got a good finish on it, it holds up well, looks nice, it's okay. Um, if you need to go a step more, go a step more. Uh, but I like what Bob just showed us. I, I'm, I've just now penciled out a sketch of what I want to build because my first ornamental eighth was MDF. And I stepped up from there, but I no longer can weld and do the fitting stuff. I want one. I'm going to go to Grange or MSC Direct. I'm going to find the collars and I'm going to find a Pardon me, all the other parts I can buy retail off the internet, and uh, I, I got to get me one. Thank you, Bob. That was a fantastic demonstration.